grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I think there's some words in here that we can identify with. Mm, cave. Cave. Gloom. We all have those days. You've been telling me about them as I listen to you and I still continue my ministry here. Some of you have, um, you feel defeated. You feel helpless. The enemies, your enemies are overwhelming you. I've had a bad week too. I don't tell you all the gory details, but uh, there have been some, um, some logistical challenges with ending one ministry and saying goodbye to one pastor and moving in another uh, minister and, and allowing him to begin his ministry. The devil is working hard at helping us feel defeated and not feel the power of Jesus. You ever feel helpless? Hmm? Impotent? Incapable of handling your problems? Whether they're financial, that's another one. One son um, called and said, uh, I really don't want to tell you this, but I'm having money problems. What a surprise. <laughs> what a surprise. He's a teacher. He doesn't get income for July and August, and yet the rent is expected in, uh, in a couple of weeks. So he needs a little bit help. He felt overwhelmed. He felt gloomy. You could tell in the tone of his voice. He felt like he was in a cave. So did Jairus. So did Jairus. In Luke chapter 8, which closes out the chapter, there's a man that came to Jesus and said, I feel helpless. I have a little girl. She's 12 years old, my precious daughter, and she's sick. She's very, very sick. My hunch is that Jairus, who had a good job, he was the leader of a synagogue, not necessarily a rabbi, but he ran a congregation, take, took his precious daughter to the physicians. And like the woman who wasn't 12 years old, but for 12 years had suffered a chronic bleeding, <clears throat> he had spent his time, his fortune, and his efforts on physicians who were unable to help. He was probably broke. And likely, like the woman with 12 years of bleeding, of chronic bleeding, she was not just not getting better, she was growing worse. So Jairus gets out of bed, gets out of his ca cave, shakes off his gloom enough to come to Jesus, whom he had heard could do the impossible, whom he had heard had power over nature. Maybe hearing that story about the storm and the disciples uh, being rescued from Jesus in that storm at the lake, power over nature. Maybe hearing the story of the man who had um, many uh, uh, um, spirits, spiritual forces, dark spiritual forces, whose body and mind was the dwelling place of the devil and his troublemakers, and this poor man was out of his mind. And yet Jesus showed the exit door to those spirits and gave the man his mind back. Mm. Jairus came to Jesus and asked for help. You ever feel helpless? I guess it's the question I just asked in a different, in a different phrase, in a different way. You ever felt helpless? There was a man, I have the notes up here, who felt very helpless. His name was um, old-fashioned name because he lived in the 1800s. His name was uh, Horatio Spafford. He lived in the 1800s. In 1871, in his hometown of Chicago, tragedy struck, and the fire of Chicago ravaged the city. When it was finally extinguished, the fire had taken over 300 lives and had left 100,000 Chicagoans homeless. Horatio Gates Spafford was one of those who tried to help the people of the city get back on their feet. Spafford, a Chicago lawyer who had invested heavily into the downtown area, lost everything as a result of the fire. He certainly must have felt helpless. 
More tragically, the year before, Spafford had also suffered the loss of his only son. Still, for two years, Spafford kind of pulled it together and assisted the homeless, the impoverished, the grief-stricken, and others ruined by the Chicago Fire of 1871. After about two years of such hard, altruistic work, Spafford and his family decided to take a vacation. They were, go to, they were to go to England, and they were going to go to an evangelistic crusade there, followed by vacation, travel in Europe. Horatio Spafford was delayed by some business, but sent his family on ahead. He would catch up to them on the other side of the ocean. <coughs> their ship, no, not the Titanic, their ship, the Ville de Havre, never made it. Off in Newfoundland, Newfoundland, which isn't too far off the coast of the United States, early in the trip, it collided with uh, another boat, an English sailing ship, the Loch Urn, and sank within the hour. Though Horatio's wife, Anna, was able to cling to a piece of floating wreckage, one of merely 47 survivors among hundreds, they had four daughters, Maggie, Tanetta, Annie, and Bessie, who died. Horatio received a horrible telegram from his wife, only two words long, saved alone. Anna, only saved. Spafford boarded the next available ship to be near his grieving wife. When the ship passed near the spots where his daughters died, out there off the coast of Newfoundland somewhere, it sounds like Spafford took pen and paper and leaned over the rail of the ship and penned these precious words. Helpless words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea bellows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. Jesus has power. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet. That's what happened to me this week. That's what happened to you this week. Mm, didn't go so well at the job. The family squabbles continue. Maybe they grow worse. You, like son Peter, short with money. The devil assails his church with all kinds of problems. Did you notice the news didn't get any better? A week ago, we were reeling from the Dallas shootings. This week, the world is reeling from another act of terrorism. Does it ever stop? Though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded your helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Well, Jairus' worst fears came true. First of all, there was an interruption. There was a yellow line between his request and Jesus acting on his behalf. It's the story we studied last week, that Jesus has power over disease. But his worst fears came true when, as Jesus was still speaking to this now healed woman, what about my girl? Come on, Jesus, let's get going. He sees somebody coming from his household, and they say, don't bother the master anymore. Why not? What a helpless feeling. What a helpless feeling. But Jesus hears your words, like he heard Jairus's, and it says, have no fear. Have no fear. I will go with you. What? Jesus? What can you do? Hmm? What can you do? It's like a plant dying. There's no hope. It's like a church whose membership is thinning out. It's like a world which is going to pot. Violence every day. It's like you running out of money. What can you do? 
Have no fear. Where's your house? He goes to the house. Sure enough, she's dead. How do you know? Because in those days, they had professional mourners. When someone died, they hired mourners to come and grieve on behalf of the family, which also served as kind of an announcement to the community that there's been a death in this household. Oh, they were good. They wailed and they wept and they cried. There was no doubt that there was a death in this house. Jesus arrives, sees all the commotion, hears all this professional announcement and mourning, <coughs> and he says, be quiet. She's not dead, she's asleep. Now, she was dead, and Jesus knew she was dead, but Jesus sees death in a different way. He sees it as temporary. When he says she's asleep, he's saying she's dead, but not for very long. Like your nap, except Sid's. Sid's naps are really long, okay? He really sleeps, okay? This length of the service. Oh, man, I'm done. <laughs> All right, I'll move it up. Okay, it's asleep, it's temporary. Because, you see, Jesus has power not only over nature, not over spiritual forces, not over disease, but your ultimate enemy, which is death. It's your biggest problem, and Jesus has power over that. So he shoos everybody away. He takes 25% of his disciples. He takes mom and dad upstairs because this is not entertainment. This is his ministry. And he says to the little girl who is dead, <coughs> but showing to the world that it is temporary, and says, little girl, get up. And she gets up right away, right away. That's part of it. As I listen to you this week, I got quite a bit of feedback from last Sunday's service. about You make it sound so simple. Jesus, just ask Jesus to heal. Make it sound so simple. It is simple. Ask Jesus. Now, there might be a delay. You might not get what you want right away, but that doesn't mean Jesus is powerless. Jesus has power over everything. By the way, that's one of my biggest problems. I want solutions yesterday. Right? That's why this week I kind of fell apart. You know, oh, the problem, the, well, this, the furniture, get out, get in, move out, when you do, da, 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 da. No, no, I want it now. Now solve it now. Okay? And I get gloomy because I start thinking, Jesus is powerless. He's not powerless. He might delay a little bit. Poor Jairus, he delayed long enough the girl died. So when there's a delay, don't fall apart like Pastor Gary. You are better people. Huh? If the church is not full six months after Pastor Doug gets here, don't fall apart and tell Pastor Doug not to get fall apart either because there might be a delay. That doesn't mean Jesus is powerless. And the little girl got up. And then she ate. I like that about miracles. Sorry, I'll make this fast. But he said, and give her something to eat. Now, why does Jesus always concern about eating when people rise from the dead? He did that too when he appeared to the disciples on Easter night. Give me something to eat. Give me something to eat. And uh, Simon, uh, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, she got up right away and she started fixing dinner for them and for herself. Because dead people don't eat. And ghosts don't eat. This person is really back. It's like Chris. He'll eat. And so will I. Because we're alive. We eat because we're alive. And so she ate. And then he says, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody, which they told everybody. And um, that's a, a footnote on that is Jesus, Jesus wasn't about making a name for himself. He was about doing the kingdom of God, which culminates on his death on the cross, which eliminates eternal death, which eliminates hell. Jesus not only has power over the plant, and us when we die, but eternal death. He has closed the gates of hell. That's what Easter is about. Freak! Close, lock. Close the gates of hell. Isn't that great? You can't get in if you tried. 
because Jesus has power over death, having paid for your sins. Okay, we don't want Sid to sleep too long this afternoon, so I'm going to say the magic word. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the power of Jesus and his compassion until life everlasting.